Welcome to the art lecture series, um, week four. <clears throat> um, we Today, we want to warmly welcome Hilma's Ghost, a feminist collective with um, Danielle Tegeter and Shermis DeRay, <laughs> um, who are coming to join us. Um, I usually have a student to introduce them, but I'm not sure the student is joining us. So I'm gonna go ahead and um, introduce you all myself. Both are painters in their own right. They uh, are both abstract painters with uh, different subjects, but, but working in the realm of what's called non-objective abstraction. <clears throat> so it's not referencing objects and images um, as discrete uh, subjects. So it's working more with formal um, aspects of color and line and composition and the materials that they use. Together, they formed um, a feminist art collective called Hilma's Ghost. Uh, they started in 2020. They're both they both reside in Brooklyn. And uh, they're, what they're trying to do is address an existing art historical or multiple art, art historical gaps by cultivating a global network of women, non-binary and trans practitioners whose work addresses spirituality, I think kind of writ large. They um, will tell us how they come about painting, but they paint together. This is not just a collective Art, art collective, but it's actually they they create eat the individual pieces working in response to each other and working together. <clears throat> um, they uh, exhibited uh, abstract abstract futures tarot at, at the Armory Art Fair in 2021, um, and they have right now uh, and up through November 1st a solo exhibition of their works on a more a tr more sort of part of the Hilma era um, material, which is on velvet. They've been painting on velvet. They'll tell us, I'm sure, about that. And it's called Radical Spirits, and that's up at the Hillstead Museum in Connecticut. They've also worked to create a growing online community of over 6,000 people through exhibitions, curating, and online programming, which connects artists with professional healers um, through workshops. And they've run a dozen such online programs with on subjects ranging from automatic drawing to sigil, sigil making, sigil making. Okay, so welcome. Applause, applause. Uh, just they're going to speak for an hour and then we will move to Q&A. So a reminder for you all to raise your virtual hands to ask a question. That's what we prefer. So we have a little interaction. Um, and or put your questions in the Q and A, and then we'll go through them, and we'll have some dialogue after they speak. So thank you all for being here. Thank you so much, Shaw, for that wonderful introduction. Um, and we're so happy to be here um, at Evergreen. And I see that we have uh, quite a few people here today. Um, and so we're excited to introduce Hilma's ghost to you all. Um, Shaw's introduction was so thorough that I you know, just have a few things to add. Um, but before I do that, I would like to start sharing my screen. Um, yeah, um, so as Shaw said, we are a feminist artist collective. Uh, what I would like to just add to Shaw's wonderful introduction is that we are named after our namesake, um, Hilma F. Clint, uh, who was a, you know, um, and her ground, you know, she had a groundbreaking exhibition at the Guggenheim in 2018, which really, um, you know, revealed to the world that she was a pioneer of abstract art even before Vasily Kandinsky. And this really, led to the rewriting of art history uh, as we know it. Um, and of course, this had to do with the erasure of women artists and especially uh, those who were working with subjects that are continued, uh, you know, that continue to be tabooed, such as spirituality, mysticism, magic, so and so forth. Um, so um, this obviously served as a reckoning um, for art history's blind spots. And we believe that uh, Western society's false binary between spirituality and science has served to 
overlook women artists and those are the gaps that we look to fill. Um, so we act as a restorative project. And that is Hilma's ghost, you see. Uh, sorry, that is Hilma Clint. <laughs> we are Hilma's ghost. Um, we work through processes of collaboration. As Shaw said, we work together. Um, and that means we are like jazz musicians in a room. Um, as Danielle often says that, you know, musicians are really taught to work collaboratively, but, you know, art education is still, or in art studio education still focuses on the artist as an individual. And, um, you know, the collaborative can really open up uh, new forms of knowledge and thought. And so we really work together in this way. It's very collaborative. We share materials in a studio space um, and we make paintings and drawings. And recently we've made an artist book. Um, so we are really expanding. We've also made a video. Um, so, you know, we, you know, we're kind of interdisciplinary at this point. Um, we work to build community. Community is one of the most important things for us. Um, you know, and we started during the pandemic at the height of the pandemic, and it was a way to really connect people. And today, as Shaw said, we have a community of about 6,000 people online and it is ever growing. We do free workshops uh, with um, healers and pra magic practitioners, and we make that uh, you know, available to the public. Uh, we do have another workshop on death coming up very soon. And I hope uh, you will all keep uh, you know, following us and seeing what we do and attend our future workshops. Um, and so I'm gonna hand it over to Danielle, who, I'm um, sorry, um, I'm gonna hold, hand it over to Danielle hey, Tegeder, so, who is actually going to do something very special for us. So anyway, thank you for everyone who has come and I was out at Evergreen um, about four years ago and I did a talk on my work. So I love it there and it was a really, really wonderful experience. So thank you for coming to our talk and um, you know, as Shemissa said, we're going to do something a little special. This isn't going to be like your mother's artist talk. So uh, we always infuse all of our programming um, with rituals and things like that. And we'll do an invocation at the end of our talk. But I'm going to do a little bit of a simple um, candle magic ritual for us. And I'll walk you through it um, just because it'll be it'll be fun. And we'll do a little bit about um you know, creativity and so forth. So first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take a little uh, Palo Santo, which I'm sure many of you know. And to cleanse everything. So I'm just going to begin, this will just be about two minutes. So I'm gonna take a clear quartz crystal. This aids in communication. So we really need it to kind of through our talk and to cultivate everything. And <clears throat> we're going to start with um, this orange candle. Any of you who are familiar with kind of simple candle magic, um, this is called a chime candle um, and they go by colors. So different colors correlate with different things. So there's like green for prosperity, blue for healing, white for purity, um, orange really connects into um, creativity and new ideas. And so that's why I chose it for us today. And so, but the first thing we're going to do is we're gonna dress the candle. And um, what that means is we're going to um, take a little bit of oil. And this is a prosperity oil that I bought in a hoodoo shop in New Orleans, but there's tons of these oils all over. You can use, I'm gonna put it on my hands and when you want to manifest something coming in, you wanna go down okay, rather than out. So we cover this with oil. I'm gonna take some herbs. I, I chose Irish moss for us. That's a little bit of a prosperity um, to bring in new ideas. I'm gonna sprinkle them and kind of cover the candle. Now, many times you also can kind of carve sigils and um, whatever you, things that you want to manifest into the candle. We're not gonna do that today because we just don't have the time, but um, you know, that's a lot of fun if you wanna do all these things. So I'm gonna light it for us for the duration of our talk. Just kind of meditate for a moment on kind of clear communication 
community, creativity for all of us moving through the semester and in our lives. And as a final touch, I'm just going to take some citrine chips. Any of you know anything about crystals? Citrine kind of also is prosperity and bringing in ideas. So I'm kind of just draping them over. So we have our little simple chime spell to kind of move through and I'll put that next to us. Um, really beautiful as we kind of move through things. And so I'm going to begin with um, our Abstract Futures Tarot. And this was our first project. Homeless Ghost was born during the pandemic and we started doing online programming very much like this. But then our first physical project was creating our own tarot deck. <clears throat> and I have one of them here. I'm just going to kind of take it out. Pocket and, them. and I'll kind of go through. Yeah, so, and there it is also on the left. Um, and as Shah said, um, you know, we're both abstract artists. So the many of you who are familiar with tarot, it's fairly unusual to have an abstract tarot deck, um, but most of them are coming from the deck on the right which is um, the Rider Waite deck. We call it the Rider Waite Smith deck. Um, that's because the artist on your left is Pamela Coleman Smith. And this deck was created in 1909. Um, Pamela Coleman Smith was the artist who uh, was not credited um, for quite a long time. And, um, and this deck really has become the inspiration and really kind of organizational tool for almost, for literally thousands and thousands of decks. And, you know, we are by far not the only artists to create decks. <laughs> There's of course, Leonora Carrington, uh, Salvador Dali, um, and on and on. We can go through so many. And this is all the original drawings for the deck um, that was shown at the Armory Fair in New York. And they are basically the, the major arcana are on the left, you know anything about the tarot, but there are four suits that follow that. So there's the pentacles, which we did in blue, swords, which is the gray, yellow are cups and wands are on the right. So these were the original artworks. And then the deck was addition. So these are some examples of the pentacles and the pentacles traditionally are associated with money, material things, earthly manifestations. And yeah, and these are swords and swords are again, traditionally, um, I always say everyone's afraid of the swords, challenges. So they kind of cut both ways. They're also intellectual endeavors. Um, the one on the card on the left is actually our ace. So an ace is always the beginning of something. So in a way, this could be the beginning of an intellectual endeavor or it could cut through confusion. So to give you an idea of some of the conceptual meanings of them. We also um, did a number of paintings from readings. And so we would create a five spread reading. And what you're seeing on the right um, is actually the reading. And we work with a lot of practitioners, but we work very much collaborating with a witch named Sarah Potter, who is a professional tarot reader and a professional witch. Um, and so this was her reading. This was the title from her. So again, it was another level of collaboration. And then this painting, which is huge painting, um, came from really fusing those five cards together. So there was a lot of symbolism in them. And, you know, on a closing note of that, like we've activated these cards in a lot of ways. And there's a few other, you know, other examples of these paintings, but, you know, there were readings through the fair. Um, we've done different projects with them. If I was with you in person, I would probably have you pull cards. Um, so they really work again, like furthering the collaboration and, and community. Yeah, and you know, just to kind of add to that, 
um, you know, tarot, of course, is a form of world making. Um, and for the members, uh, you know, of the secret society that Pamela Coleman Smith was a part of, um, you know, they believe that making a tarot deck was a rite of passage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I want to say like, you know, magic is really about transformation and artists really know that inherently, they know that act already. Um, so it's really about completely transforming something. And I just want to say, you know, a little, we should say a little bit about just the materiality on the paintings. Um, the cards were all on heavy paper, colored paper, paper, and they were gouache ink. Um, the paintings are all on canvas and they're acrylic flash and they're also sprayed. And most of them get, um, you know, masked and things like that. And again, like we work back and forth. So we're both working on these at the same time. And because we come from schools of non-object painting, but very different philosophies, um, you know, we can usually tell which parts each of us have done. It really is a back and forth. And sometimes, you know, Danielle will go in and destroy something I've done or add to it and I will do the same. So it really is a conversation uh, that happens between us, um, you know, in developing these works. Um, our next project was uh, Cosmic Geometries. This was again, uh, an exhibition we curate, but, well, this was our, uh, the first exhibition we curated together. Um, it was at EFA, um, it was at EFA Project Space. Daniel is gonna go find us a catalog uh, because we just printed a catalog uh, for the show um, in which there is an essay and so and so forth. Um, but again, this exhibition was a way for us to support our community, build community connections and get artists to start knowing each other. You know, these exhibitions, even though it's become more um, accepted as, you know, these subjects have become more accepted of divinity, of the cosmos, of, you know, mysticism and magic after the Hilma Afklin show that still there's so much room for expansion in these areas. And so uh, this was an exhibition of 25 intergenerational and diverse artists, um, mostly from the United States, but really from very different backgrounds. Um, you know, we had artists from South America, from India, from, you know, from many uh, different places, Mexico, et cetera. Um, and so, um, for this exhibition, we also under, you know, we went, you know, um, uh, took part in processes of divination in rituals. This is our witch on the right, Sarah Potter. I say she's our witch because she can never work with anyone else now. <laughs> you know, we, we, we like she's keep her. She's a lot of people's witch. I know she's a lot of people's <laughs> witch, but you know, she's also someone we work very closely with. Um, and we, um, you know, uh, one of the things with this exhibition is that we, um, we did these rituals. We wrote a letter to Hilma, which I'm holding on the left-hand side here. Uh, Danielle is holding up the Wheel of Fortune from the tarot, from our deck. Um, and we burned the letter. And the letter was really asking for uh, support for our community, for recognition for this community, for the work that we are doing. Um, and, you know, happily we got, a, you know, a nice review in the New York Times. So that was, <laughs> that was a nice response. We're not complaining with that. The spirits you know, came through. The spirits came through. <laughs> but, you know, we also, you know, uh, quote unquote, blindly place the works through divination. So everything in the show, its placement was based on divinatory practice and chance. What we call chance, but we believe there are no coincidences. It was really by the placement of these tarot cards um, you know, pairing the works with these our tarot cards and then laying out the tarot cards blindly uh, and the works wherever the paired work uh, fell, we would place it there. Mm -hmm. So here you have um, you know, some of the artists, Marilyn Lerner, Rico Gatson, Natessa Amin, uh, Stephen Mueller, Anoka, Fru uh, uh, Anoka Faruqi, and David Driscoll and Dorothea Rockburn. And this is the catalog Cosmic Geometries, uh, which is also now um, available on the EFA project website as well as- And on our website. And on, on, our, our, and on our website yeah. as well. Um, thank you. And here are some other views of the exhibition. This is, you can see a pairing here with Grace De Janeiro's work. And the, this is a lover card um, from our tarot. And interestingly enough, the lover's card is not just about romantic 
dual, you know, dualisms, but it's also about dualism and binaries. And uh, those are the ideas that Grace de Janeiro works with. So there are really some pairings are that are really, you know, they're um, incomprehensible to us just because they're so, they are mystical and they're divined in this way. And just, you know, just on a closing note of that, and just to be clear, because it's a little confusing, like the show is completely laid out with our tarot. So basically we chose a tarot through rituals for each painting and we are not in the exhibition. The show is really other artists. And then it was completely laid out around the room in that way. So completely an antithesis to a very intellectual way of usually the way you might lay out a show, right? And kind of struggle with it. Um, it was simply laid out um, and it was, you know, of course, like it was a, it was a beautiful layout. There was nothing we changed at all. It was perfect. So I don't know what that means, but it makes you wonder. So <laughs> we think Hilma is a very good Hilma curator. Helps. Yeah. So, <laughs> so this is a, a new series of works on paper um, that we just completed called Chromagic. And so they're about 40 by 27 inches. It's a very kind of, again, heavy colored paper, Fabriano, Fabriano which is the same thing that the tarot cards were made on. Um, and with these, we really infuse just like cosmic geometries, um, rituals, and a lot, also we worked a lot with crystal magic and color magic. So again, going back to our candle, I mean, we could teach a whole class in color magic or crystals, of course, um, but you know, basically there's a lot of kind of, um, you know, like again, orange, creativity, white purity, um, you know, white cleansing, orange creativity. We can go on and on with a lot of the associations of the backgrounds. Um, on them. But the other added element of this is the paint was also infused with crystals that um, went along with some of the, you know, the correlations with the color. And again, you know, this was um, similar as you see the titles that I mentioned before. Um, Sarah read these. Um, these were created again through our tarot. So the elements and the shapes in them were again transformed and kind of fused. But you can pick out some of the elements if you had our tarot deck, you'd be able to kind of see some of the ones that went in there. And I'll just kind of go through these. And again, um, gem infused um, watercolors. This was, I think there was citrine in this one, which I just used in the candle as well. And in some ways they're again, used almost as like, almost like you would get a reading, you know, if you would, if you would go and kind of these cards would be laid out. And these are in our show right now at, at Hillstead. This um, is our color wheel that goes along with all the crow magic. So this, I'll just give you a minute to kind of read through like some of the elements of, um, you know, the different um, associations with um, the color. There's gemstones that are in the middle. There is the element. Um, after that, and there's the title. So this gives you a little bit of a reading um, of each breakdown. And there were this many drawings in, in the whole series. Yeah, if you're familiar with kind of Western color systems and, you know, the Bauhaus <laughs> circle, you know, there are, um, you know, many kind of generative color systems that have been created and, you know, as a feminist collective, we really wanted to make one that was based, you know, uh, within the ideas um, that we're working with. And we are very much practitioners ourselves. We involve ourselves in these rit rituals. Um, you know, um, we call ourselves believing skeptics in that, of course, we are very engaged uh, with these rituals. We work closely with practitioners, but we're also, of course, very art historically rooted. Um, and we keep coming back to really overlooked women artists. Um, just to go back a little bit to the cosmic geometries as well, um, you know, um, 
and the ideas of, you know, geometries and their linking to these ideas of mysticism and the cosmos, et cetera. You know, of course, these artists have all been showing for many years. It was intergenerational, but many of them said that they have not been brought together in this way. And so it really opened up a realm of meaning within their own work. A nice story is that Dorothea Rockburn, who is now in her 90s, um, you know, came uh, to the exhibition and we met her and she said to us, you know, you've really done something here. And I think that meant a lot to us. Yeah, the show ranged from age 26 to 95, <laughs> which, was, which was pretty great. Yeah, and really encompassing world cultures as well um, in that sense, you know, and, and schools of abstraction. So, um, and, you know, people working in different materials uh, with painting, especially. So um, this is also on our website. So if you're interested in using it, uh, experimenting with it, we, you know, we give this to you to use in your classes, play with it, see if it works for and you. We, we, on, an, on that similar note, um, almost all of our programming is for free. If you go on to at Hilma's Ghost into our link tree, all of our programming with our practitioners um, is free. It's all on there. There's tarot programming, there's witchcraft programming. We worked with a shaman. We worked with someone doing automatic drawing. Uh, as Shemissa mentioned, we're also doing um, death programming coming up. And we, we just wrote this book, um, Rituals for Grieving, which are these kind of somatic fluxus rituals for grieving. And it's actually at a new space in Portland, which <laughs> is not too far from you. So if you end up in Portland, um, you can get this book for free there. So giving them away, but we're also going to make it available on our, our website tomorrow. And we'll be doing programming coming up with that. So you can always join our mailing list. Mm -hmm. And we really welcome participatory engagement. And so, um, so these are ways of activating communities that we don't even know, you know, we're not even in contact yet with yet, but you know, people find us and we find them through this work. Um, this is, a, you know, one of our current projects that are going on. Um, it is at the Hillstead Museum in Farmington, Connecticut. Um, it's called Tarot, Radical Spirits, Tarot, Automatism, and Feminist Histories, really tying together three parts of our practice. Um, and what's really interesting, this exhibition is going on till November 1st. So if you find yourself in Connecticut before the end of the month, then please go, do go by and visit. Um, the picture you see on the left-hand side is the new contemporary art space that they have built as part of uh, an extension to a historic house um, that was built by the woman on the right, Theodate Pope Riddle. Um, she came from quite an affluent family, you know, late 19th century, early 20th century. Um, you know, she was one of the first female uh, licensed architects in this country. Um, you know, of course, because it was a time where women couldn't be licensed in this way or certified as architects, but she was she managed to, you know, uh, not only get her license, but also to construct uh, several, you know, uh, several estates and including this one, which she she, um, you know, she designed and built for her parents. Um, a note about the house, um, it has an interesting history. Um, you know, her father was an avid collector um, and he actually, you know, bought impressionist and post-impressionist works before they, you know, before they went off the charts like they have today in the marketplace. You know, he would be spending time with these artists in their studios in Paris and he usually got the works directly from them. So this house has like, invaluable Monet water lilies, you know, <laughs> it has like this collection, it has Manet's and it has, you know, but all of these were bought, bought for a song, you know, um, he was really a patron of the arts. And um, Theodore Pope Riddle was less um, interested um, in the arts, but she did certainly preserve this house. Um, and she was a major uh, philanthropist. She was a suffragette, someone who works, worked for women's rights. And she was, uh, you know, the hidden history of this house is that she was also a spiritualist. And she, um, after the passing away of a close friend and her adopted son, um, you know, she was trying to find ways to 
um, you know, work with her grief. And so um, interestingly enough, it was the artist Mary Cassatt, um, who we don't really think of as being a magic practitioner or, you know, cultivating this occult space in her work, but she was very much involved. They were good friends. And she actually introduced Theodate Pope Riddle uh, to uh, the occult world, the spirit world, seances, and which was really big um, at the end of the 19th and early 20th centuries. Um, do you want to add? Especially in New England. I mean, I think the interesting thing is that, um, you know, these people also died on the Lusitania. So she died on the Lus like she almost died on the Lusitania. She was on the Lusitania ship, and, right. Um, you know, so really, again, just kind of a very storied, um, you know, tale. But basically, another thing I think that's really interesting is this area of Connecticut and in New England is about 15 miles away from the first witch execution, um, you know, in the country. So it's, it's, again, connects a lot into spiritualism and the occult, but again, how it aligns politically with what was happening. Um, you know, for women historically, I think we find really interesting. Yeah, and spiritualism was really a space that enabled these women to feel self-empowered. You know, uh, women were often equal to men in those spaces. Mm -hmm. They had leadership positions. And so um, it was really becoming uh, an alternative religion, really. And ironically was struck down also by organized religion, uh, which still has tabu tabooed it today. We have a fun story about our tarot deck. <laughs> <laughs> Do you we want to tell that story? We have a lot of fun stories. I mean, one of our tarot decks was um, sent to somebody. I mean, you know, people buy our tarot decks. You can buy them on our link tree or through our gallery. And it was sent to the wrong house. In Pennsylvania. In rural, Pennsylvania. Rural Pennsylvania. Rural Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania. And um, the woman who bought the deck, who was a professor in a university in Pennsylvania, I won't name any names, went to the house and said, I think you got my package. And they said, yes, we opened it and, um, and we burned it. So like they burned our deck and we just actually thought this was hilarious and that we were probably doing something right. Well, yeah, um, they, <laughs> <laughs> well, actually this, this, the man who opened the door said, you know, my mother opened the package and this is the work of the devil. They were yeah. well, evangelical I, I, Christians. I think um, that's, a, that's an interesting <laughs> topic. I think especially like at the climate that we're in, in this country. And I think this really goes into women collectively who were healers and had a lot of power and especially the, the spiritualist movement um, around this time period. Again, it was the first time that women had any leadership in any kind of organized religion um, or any kind of religion period. And so I think it's um, you know, no big surprise that it was actually struck down, right? Um, you know, we see that kind of systematically you know, through kind of like the patriarchy, you know, so. Yeah, um, so moving on here, uh, on the left-hand side, you see an example of occult photography <laughs> with Danielle suspended in the air. Uh, we have no idea what she was doing. <laughs> it's actually, you know, this photograph is completely undoctored. And I was sitting across from Danielle. It was just the three of us in this historic house at Hillstead in the dining room. Uh, that is Sarah Potter, our witch, who is also a medium. And we conducted a seance um, in the house um, and right Opposite Sarah in front of her is a portrait of Theodate Pope Riddle. So we were alone in this house. Uh, we conducted rituals and we uh, did witchcraft and we all, Sarah conducted a seance during which we were drawing. Another note about the draw, you know, the automatism, the auto automatism is that, um, you know, this, this li the, the, the house has this incredible library which has a, an incredible collection of turn of the century books on occult, on the occult and spiritualism. Um, and it also, um, you know, they have an archive of the automatic writings um, from Theodate's many seances. Um, you know, she would meet leading um, mediums around the country. The most popular was um, Leonora Piper. She's well known. There are books that have been written on her. Uh, I believe she lived somewhere in Boston or Massachusetts, and she 
um, you know, uh, there were many seances conducted and the automatic writings were part, very much part of our research for this project. And that's why we wanted to engage processes of automatism as artists for ourselves. And this is one of the, way, in one of the ways we did it. And, um, you know, during the seance, Sarah um, would actually give us prompts that she would receive drawing prompts, which we would use. They could be color prompts. And we actually, um, you know, did a whole bunch of automatic drawings um, that way. And I, we still don't know what Daniel is doing suspended in the air. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I mean you know, I, I want to go back to what you must have said that, you know, we're both believing skeptics in this and we're, you know, we're both like fairly, I think pretty fairly serious people. And, you know, sure. Miss is a theorist and, you know, we went into this with this idea of exploration and we're interested in these ideas for a lot of reasons. And, you know, and then these kind of weird unexplained things happening. So, I, you know, we just set up the phone in the seance because we wanted to take, honestly, some shots for Instagram. <laughs> and I was just floating. So um, we don't know what that means, but um, again, fascinating. Yeah. Um, well, you know, it, it's, it makes me think of occult photography um, and 19th and 20th century occult photography. You're like, was that doctored? You know, <laughs> but then you're, I look at this photo and I'm like, what is going on? Like, we definitely didn't touch this picture. So it makes me actually feel much more aligned with occult photography. And there's clearly something the camera can see that we cannot. <laughs> um, on the right hand side is, um, actually, do you want to talk about this? Sure. So, you know, we spent a lot of time um, in this historic house, which is really exquisitely beautiful and full of all sorts of paintings and collectibles. Um, and in Theodate's bedroom, um, in the drawer, and we went through the house with the archivist, was this small painting. It's about five inches by five inches. And it was on velvet. And Shumas and I were both kind of, we both have taught painting for many years. And I've never seen anything like this. So we were both really enchanted with this painting. And she said it's, a, it's something called a theorem painting. So theorem painting in the 19th century um, came from New England. It was a craft that came into New England and it was marketed to girls' academies, housewives, they sold theorem kits from door to door. And they were kits where you had stencils and basically you pushed paint into this velveteen, essentially, and it was for decorations. One of the, there's five heritage crafts um, in the United States, and there's tin painting, some of you, glass painting, but there's something, this is theorem painting. So you can see these in very important decorative arts collections around the turn of the century, but a lot of them were done just by, you know, kind of everyday women. So we were pretty fascinated with these. Yeah, and that one was most likely made by Theodate's grandmother or great grandmother. Um, and so really became the basis uh, for the work that we did in the show. And we would like to show you a little bit of our process in this video because it really shows, um, you know, the processes that we uh, underwent, you know, undertook in order to make this work. So it starts to show you- This whole video is on our, our website. But we're going to show you just two minutes of it. And partly it shows the process of how we learned how to make a theorem painting. We actually went to the Quakers um, in Pennsylvania to learn. They're one of the few groups that actually still know how to make these. And of course, we didn't make fruit bowls. We made um, our abstractions. Um, but the stencils were cut in the same way. We worked on velveteen. And so um, this will show a little bit of that and a little bit of the process of how we work. I'll just uh, cue it to the point that we want it. And we'll show you two minutes of it, but the whole video, um, like I said, it's on our website and shows more of the house and the history of spiritualism. We can probably show a little bit more, right? Okay, whatever you want. Yeah. American colonies occurred in Hartford at a site just 10 oh, miles east of Farmington, the location of Hillstead in 1647. Hilma's ghost found Theodate, or rather Theodate found Hilma's ghost through the collective. Hey, yeah. yeah. The, the video isn't actually moving. We can hear the audio, but not the video. Well, Oh, really? Yeah. Oops. Okay. 
Yeah. Um, hold on. Let me do this. Do you see it now? Lifelong involvements with spiritualism and feminism. No, it's still like if we see the video still up there and the arrow is still on pause rather than play. Oh, that's strange. Sure, Sharon, we'll try it. We'll try it one more time. Okay. People can just watch it. With it. notable mediums and funding important research. Automatic writing from those seances. Oh, just, uh, just the audio. Oh, is a core okay. element of this exhibition, which entwines the history of spiritualism okay, in the well, Americas and Europe with automatic processes in the arts. As part of their research, Tegeter and Gray participated with Sarah Potter okay, in Channel Energy. No, that you're, the shared screen's off. It's just you all. And other okay. ritual and divinatory practices. Sorry about that. Uh, there seems to be some tech Close PowerPoint. issue. Oh, no, well. Sorry about that. There seems to be some tech issue with that. I mean, that's okay. I mean, I, I would say go ahead and watch it, but I, we can talk a little bit about the process that the stencils were cut and then you basically push oil paint into velvet um, around the kind of stencil um, or into it. So I'm just going to hit that one more time just to make sure it doesn't. And anyway, let's talk about paintings. Yeah. Um, so we essentially uh, did these written prompts. Um, which we came up through, we created a magic space or rather Sarah Potter uh, created that magic space for us um, within which we did these written prompts and she would then instruct us. And that's how all the compositions were actually made. Um, and then these uh, compositions were transferred onto uh, cotton velvet, um, which is, you know, this is gorgeous material, but neither of us had ever painted on cotton velvet and neither of us really use oil paint anymore in our practice. So it really was um, this kind of expedited process of learning an entirely new medium. And we actually um, got in touch with the leading living um, theorem painter in the country. She's a master craftswoman and she lives in rural Pennsylvania. Uh, rural Pennsylvania and us, we obviously have some karma, <laughs> karma to sort out, but you know, we landed up in Linda Brubacher's basement um, in which we uh, learned, got a crash course in theorem painting from her. Um, it's kind of, um, she's really one of the very, very few practitioners left, has written many books, but she was so generous. She was like, just get on a train, come here, I'll give you the materials, I will teach you. Like such a great teacher and such a formidable craftswoman, you know, it's like, it really humbles you as um, contemporary artists. And so um, this was one of five paintings that we did. And it's a really laborious technique. We created about 200 stencils <coughs> for these, um, to make these paintings. And the way it works is that you, hold the stencil, stencil to the surface, and then you push the oil paint into the surface and you get these um, incredible we'll gradations. We'll play the video after we stop the PowerPoint, we'll try to bring up the site and we'll try it one more time. So you can actually see it. If not, you'll have to see it on your own. <coughs> Excuse me, do you want to say something? Yeah, I mean, and these are, again, there was five of them. They're fairly large paintings. I would say one question that, was a big thing for us, you know, as well that we get asked a lot is, are, how, are they archival? <laughs> like, you know, can you, can you, cause they're, they're actually stained oil paint onto velvet essentially. So apparently they are weirdly. Um, and the decorative paintings from the turn of the century have kind of all, there's a bit, I would say like there's extremely little paint on these. It's really a stain. You almost wipe out completely um, the oil paint in the process of it. Um, and that's very different than an additive process that any of you who are painters know that you're just kind of adding a lot of paint. It's almost like you wipe it out in a way. Yeah, it was great for us to see it all together. Uh, this is at the Hillstead. This is part of the installation. And you see this um, case with our tarot deck um, in it. And here you have the five paintings together on that wall. Um, a note about the wall colors is, you know, in each of our exhibitions, uh, you know, we really try to use uh, what we say are, is a Hilma-esque kind of palette 
uh, to evoke and invoke the spirit of Hilma into that space. Um, and so here on the left, you see, you know, in this glass vessel here, the theorem painting, and to the right, again, honoring, you know, um, women um, who were maybe not professional artists because they couldn't be at that time, but still engaged in some form of creativity. Um, this is a portrait of um, Theodate's great grandmother. Um, and on the left on the wall label, there is a picture of her mother. Um, so we don't know, well, it was a grandmother, sorry. So it was either a great grandmother or her grandmother. They both have the same name. They both have the same name and it's signed. So they don't be, the, histi don't know. the art historian there doesn't know which one it was. So, you know, they're both in there, which is good. You know, it's, um, so that brings us to the end of our talk. Um, and of course, um, to find out more information about our online workshops, um, spiritual guidance and magic rituals. Um, you can find us at our website or on our Instagram at Hilma's Ghost, where we offer free moon rituals and, you know, um, rituals and participatory things that you can engage in with us. Um, and we also continue to, um, you know, sometimes have profiles of women artists and different exhibitions that are engaging the ideas that uh, we're interested in as a collective. So, so I think what we're going to do is we're going to pause that. We're going to try that video one more time for you. Let's just get rid of the PowerPoint. And see I got you. a tip from um, a colleague that to optimize for video when sharing. Oh, and how do we do that? Oh, I'll close the PowerPoint. Oh, close okay. it out. Okay. So I'm going to stop sharing. And then we'll, we'll share it from our website and that should, that should work. It usually works. Okay. Thanks. Well, let's try this. Um, you have to share it from the website. I know. Um, but I do need to share the screen. There you go. Can you see my screen? Shaw, can yes. you see? Yes. Okay. Now I'm going to play. To create five new paintings for the show. Yes. These new works recover the lost art of theorem. Yes. Paintings. You can okay. see. Okay. So okay. great. So we'll play two minutes of this. Okay. ...of independence and sexual freedom for women were met with widespread hysteria. Under these patriarchal conditions, accusations of witchcraft became powerful tools to condemn women in line to become property owners, single mothers, and women who lived in poverty. In fact, the first witch execution documented in the American colonies occurred in Hartford at a site just 10 miles east of Farmington, the location of Hillstead, in 1647. Hilma's ghost found Theodate, or rather Theodate found Hilma's ghost, through the collective's work in the unseen realm of magic and its mysteries. While Theodate's work as an architect is well documented, her lifelong involvements with spiritualism and feminist politics are much less appreciated. She passionately supported exploration of the spirit world, participating in seances with notable mediums and funding important research. Automatic writing from those seances, now housed in Hillstead's library, is a core element of this exhibition, which entwines the history of spiritualism in the Americas and Europe with automatic processes in the arts. As part of their research, Tegeter and Ray participated with Sarah Potter in channeling and drawing sessions at the historic house, all while engaging in other ritual and divinatory practices to create five new paintings for the show. These new works recover the lost art of theorem painting, a popular stenciling technique that was taught in girls' academies throughout New England in the 1800s. More than a century later, Tegeter and Ray have reimagined the techniques within theorem painting through an abstract and contemporary lens to honor and reclaim women's work. In this style, women used handmade stencils and numbered formulas to create fruit and floral arrangements that were highly favored painting subjects. Using a stiff brush on velvet areas within the plotted stencils, distinct color shapes could comprise complex compositional schemas of overlapping and interlocking forms. To make their compositions through an automatic process, Hilma's ghost created a series of written instructional and magical prompts with the help of their witch, Sarah Potter. Potter randomly drew these prompts out of a large jar while Tegeter and Ray drew. A prompt could vary from drawing geometric shapes to envisioning color meditations, tracing invisible symbols, or mixing a magical elixir to drink. The exercise utilized the element of guided intention to focus the artist's individual presence and actions. 
For the paintings, the artists created over 200 custom stencils that enabled a special staining technique for oil paints on velvet surfaces. Radical Spirits takes its title from a foundational 1980. So we're going to stop it there. Um, we just wanted to share a little bit of that process with you. And we have a really nice way of closing. Yeah, well, I just want to say a couple of closing comments, though, because we have a few minutes. So I think one thing um, that Shaw opened with is about this whole series about artists that are working with healing. And I, th I think that's something really interesting that, you know, we didn't mention of like, why is this happening now? Right. And of course, it's because, you know, we're coming out of um, the pandemic, we're coming out of um, environmental destruction. Hopefully we're coming out of it. I mean, you know, <laughs> or we're not. We're going straight, straight into <laughs> or it. We're going into it further. Um, and so, you know, it really, you know, when you look historically through history at pandemics, wars, there's always a huge upsurge in um, interest in the occult. And I think, again, you know, we're dealing with a time period where, you know, over 2 million people have died and people are really grappling not with this intellectual part of themselves you know they're really grappling with like this idea of the unknown um in a way and how do we make sense um of these things and so um you know with that we have a nice way of closing and so we have a little bit of um a little closing blessing that Shermis is going to do um and then we want to hear from you for questions yeah, so we like to close by invoking our artistic ancestors um, and our spiritual guardians. So if you don't have a candle lit right now, just imagine one or look at ours. Um, you can close your eyes if you wish, and you know you can take this as a meditation as well. We honor your spirit, your agency, the power you have invested in the cause of art. It is because of you that we find our inner strength and we use it purposefully for ourselves and the cause of feminism, for generations of women, non-binary and trans practitioners of all races, ethnicities and other markings, past, present and future. We, the guardians of the divine feminine and her internal spirit, endeavor to smash the patriarchy and build in its place a true and inclusive utopia that can hold and honor us all our creation, our sense of self, and our spirit for the cause of artistic freedom. And I will read a list of deceased women artists. If there's any women, non-binary or trans artists who have passed away, they could be friends or somebody else, uh, hold them in your mind. Hilma af Klint, died 1944, Danderid, Sweden. Augusta Savage, died 1962, New York. New York. Anna Mendieta died 1985, New York, New York. Dora Marr died 1997, Paris, France. Emma Kunz died 1963, Waldstadt, Switzerland. Hima Upadhyay died 2015, Mumbai, India. Louise Bourgeois died 2010, New York, New York. Lydia Clark died 1988, Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. Agnes Martin died 2004, Taos, New Mexico. Teresa Hak Yong Cha died 1982, New York, New York. And with that, you can open your eyes. Right, everyone take a deep breath. And I always say to try to kind of envision how we're all connected to one another in, you know, in many, many ways. Um, and so we are on time, so we're at 3.25, which is great. And so we just want to invite um, any questions from people. Thank you so much, you all. That was um, a wild ride of, for a skeptic. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it is a bridge, um, but that was also extremely moving. Um, to say the names and um there's a great i don't know if you've seen the new podcast that um helen molesworth's um put out about anna mendieta i mean not anna mendieta ava hessa oh, she's oh, not she's not, she's no, no 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 it's no it's anna mendieta yeah it, that it is really quite um she's she's pretty good at it it's pretty 
pretty shocking, pretty. Um, so yeah, I'd recommend it to anyone. Um, so I am just going to put in the chat here um, for everyone, the Zoom, the link for our, our website. But I also want to remind you to raise your hands for questions um, and comments for. We have some questions here. Yeah, right? we've got some, right? Yep. But it, but also please raise hands. So yeah, go ahead and read through these and see if they're ones that are okay. speaking I to you. Her, um, I think of tarot as an act of distilling knowledge or as a way of accessing the internal through the external. What questions do you ask yourself when translating content into form? So let content speak through form. Do you want to give in that? Yeah, I mean, there's obviously there. Well, not obviously, but there are two ways, you know, of course, there's a practical the practice. Um, uh, well, the practice of tarot, and then there's what we did as artists, which is translating the meaning and the symbols into abstraction. Um, so do you want to talk about the practice of tarot? Yeah, I mean, let me tell you just, you know, something about tarot that there's lots of ways to enter the tarot. And I just want to try we have a program called demystifying tarot that is really about, there's no one way of reading the tarot. And so, yes, there is a way of thinking of it as a divinatory or kind of fortune future telling, but there is also a Jungian way of looking at it as these are archetypes. They are kind of reflecting back. So there's psychological ways, there's philosophical ways of entering it. So many, many different, um, you know, different ways you know, to play, I, I really think it's like intuitively demystifying all of that. <clears throat> um, and there was one other question from Jasper, our program ends with a final collaborative art project <laughs> with our peers. What advice do you have for a group of artists working together for the first time? Try, Excellent question. Try not to kill each other. Well, <laughs> let me say that we say often that, um, you know, musicians and theater people are trained to work together. Artists are trained to work alone and to call the shots. And it is really um, a skill set, I think, that's not taught in art schools. And so we've really had our, our own, like, you know, challenges with all of this of negotiating things. Um, interestingly, it's not been in making the work, but it's been in a lot of other, you know, details of like budgeting or scheduling, which is something you're all going to go through. So I would just say that um, I would have really a planning meeting and, and actually an agreement in the beginning of the project of who is handling what, when are you all meeting? Um, everyone has to pull their own weight um, and almost sign it almost like an agreement, frankly, you know, of, of kind of negotiating some of these things before problems happen. Because I think we go into this in a very romantic way. And then there's the reality of, you know, you need to finish a project and the deadline. And we, we have the same reality because we have to make shows and there are projects and there are deadlines and we might be doing- There's like, budgets involved. There's bu we might be doing like um, really kind of innovative uh, spiritual or rituals or creative art making, but there's all those extra parts in there that we also have to facilitate that are maybe like a little less sexy, um, but really can trip you up. I mean, I think it's important to understand what the individual strengths are in the group naturally. Um, you know, so we have things that we're kind of like opposites in many ways, and we have different strengths. Um, and so we've just naturally um, ended up doing specific kinds of work, which then works together. But I would say keep the lines of communication really open. Um, you have to learn to listen to each other and you've got to let go of control. That's the most important thing because, you know, everybody in the group has to have equal agency in a way. And it's really kind of a ongoing conversation and so treat it as something that is dynamic as opposed to you know um no one person should be the loudest in the room you know metaphorically speaking so we have some other questions so sadie says pamela coleman smith is incredible really appreciate it absolutely pamela coleman smith amazing um leonora carrington a lot of other uh, women artists um and so moving on to... Um, I just want to say one other thing about Pamela Coleman-Smith is that um, Pamela Coleman-Smith is kind of having a, re you know, there's kind of a reemergence 
of interest around Pamela Coleman Smith. You know, of course, uh, the Rider Waite Smith deck is the most widely distributed in the modern world. Um, the tarot has something like a thousand year history. It was a pictorial system, which was passed down, really was popularized in Europe through the centuries, um, has changed and adapted, um, you know, um, but it was Pamela Coleman Smith's deck, which she did in consultation with Arthur Waite, who was, um, you know, a major occultist, um, you know, um, he was a major occultist and they worked together uh, to create that deck. But that is the first deck that has been used for the purposes, uh, solely for the purposes of divination. So it's no surprise that that is the one that has become majorly popularized, um, you know, espe especially within uh, practices of the occult. So Shaw, do you want to read the questions? Because we're getting a lot of other questions in the Q&A and now I guess there's a hand. So why don't you read the question to us? Because we're also getting confused with... <laughs> okay, why don't we call on the person, Maddie, who's raised their hand and see what they have to ask. And I'll look through these questions. Read the to us as you well. Guys Sorry. Hi, I'm Maddie. Um, I, I just wanted to know where in Portland you guys offered your booklets. You said that there was some sort of booklet or presentation out in Portland. The new uh, art space called Parallelex, and that is in Portland. There's a show on death. A lot of great artists in the show, about 20 artists. Um, it's curated by another artist called Aaron Gatch. And so our book is free and it's there. So if you end up, I would just look up Parallelex. And if you go to our Instagram, you could go, to, it's connected to Parallelex and you can give, it'll give you the address. Yeah, um, it's a book called Rituals for Grieving and we call it a pandemic handbook. And it, there is 169 fluxus type rituals, which mostly you can enact on your own. Generally, it calls for a little bit of common sense on some of them because, you know, we created these as artists and, not really, you know, uh, playing by the rules of our practical world. So uh, some of them need to be done with caution, but uh, we would love for artists to have the handbook and uh, do the rituals on their own. If you do it, please send us a photo on Instagram. We'll share it on we'll our be, stories. We'll also be doing a death program um, the first week of December. So you can look for that. We'll be talking about them. So um, there's you another hand Elijah. I'm going to just go right to Elijah and then we can go from there. You want Hi. the... Oh, sorry. <laughs> yep, um, hi, I'm Elijah. Um, so I'm a spiritualist and a tarot reader myself. So I found it really interesting to see how both of you approach your art. Um, my question would be, what are the physical and kind of internal changes that you notice when you kind of set yourself into creating your art or prepare yourself. Can you say that one more time for us? Um, what are the changes you notice in your body when you are creating your art? Well, that's an interesting question because I would include not only our body, but probably our mind and spirit, you know? Um, and I would say like, yes, like it has been transformative for us to do a lot of these rituals and so forth. You know what I mean? So, and it, I think it has shifted our belief, like we're, we're skeptical of all of this as well. You know, so it's like we went into this in a really, and many times go into it through an intellectual lens. We're both academics. We're both, um, you know, historically interested in the subject matter. But I will say that like when you get into doing this, there is like a physical transformation and a spiritual transformation that happens. Because it, it is, again, like we, we have work, we enter in an intellectual way, but I would say this work doesn't function like that. If that makes any sense. And it is cumulatively transformative as we move through. Yeah, I mean, I think with, as with most transformations, um, they're evident over a period of time. 
you know, um, in some esoteric world cultures, these transformations happen on a really subtle level, you know, but, you know, you, after you, uh, when we're looking back at the last two years, it just feels like we went down a rabbit hole, you know, and um, we're doing things that we never really thought that we would do. But it is also that not only intellectually, but spiritually also, also pulls you into it. So we're also driven as much by our curiosity, but certainly I think the cumulative changes are also um, directing us in a certain way. Um, I know that's a really abstract response, but you know, uh, hopefully that kind of answers your questions, your question. Yeah, I did, thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, I think it's very interesting to think about this idea of transformation and um, something happening cumulatively over time and the the interest here in both the, the idea of chance and setting ourselves up for chance and then thinking about them as a kind of a divinatory pro process or are we opening ourselves up to something that we're all that's happening as we, because we're also guiding it or we're opening to the to be receiving we're willing to receive so i think that's a really interesting um, process. Um, there are a couple of questions here that are probably quick to answer. What's automatism or automatic draw drawing? And how do you name your pieces? Maybe those are two good questions to start with. Yeah, um, really good questions. Um, automatic uh, writing was a process, you know, of course, there's different histories of it. But the most well known one is it, you know, automatic writing was a way of communicating with spirits through a medium. And essentially the sitter in those sittings would uh, channel through writing um, the messages that were coming from the spirit world. Usually the sitter through the aid of a medium would go into a trance-like state. So automatic writing really has connections to occultism, you know, but it was also used by the surrealist artists but the surrealists were actually much more involved in psychoanalysis rather than magic. And so for them, automatic writing was used as a way to tap the unconscious. They didn't really, um, they were mostly atheists and they didn't really believe in an afterlife. You know, they were much more interested in automatic writing um, also as a, a kind of an aesthetic conceptual tool. Um, in terms of naming our paintings, do you want to say something about that? Yeah, I mean, the paintings are named through collaborating with Sarah Potter, again, like who is the witch that we work with, who then it's almost like the reading of all the cards together. So if you went to Sarah and had a reading and you got those five cards, that statement that is used in the title is really from that. And so it's another level layer of collaboration in many ways. So Shaw, sure, would you? <laughs> yes. Um, let's you see. I think it's an interesting. There are a couple of questions here. Um, one was is about the culture, um, cultural history of Palo Santo smudging and cleansing. But then there's another one that's, I think, an interesting one about it says um, from Chris, do you find that it's harder to get funding for art based in spiritualism and mysticism than projects based on more routine topics like social justice, injustice? Have you been denied spaces because of the themes of your projects? And how do you resolve the inevitable conflicts that come up when working so closely together, which you talked about a little bit before? Well, let me, do you want me to address the Palo Santo? And okay, yeah, you can address Palo Santo. Um, yeah, so the Palo Santo, um, again, yes, we're quite aware. I knew this would come up. I knew we would get this question <laughs> So <laughs> from this crowd. So glad to see people are like super aware. Um, like, yes, this is ethically sourced. Uh, this is purchased from um, Ecuadorian hands, which are Ecuadorian farmers. Um, Palo Santo means kind of holy stick. This has been used by uh, many, many different indigenous communities through history. Um, you know, I really agree. This needs to be used ethically. We use things cross-culturally in a lot of ways and work with practitioners all the way across like many, many different cultures, but nice to see there's awareness on that. Yeah, I will um, say. Out there. Yeah, no, and along those lines, I think that Danielle and I are really conscious of um, 
cultural appropriation. And so one of the decisions, even though we use it for ourselves, you know, and we have really a different medley of tools that we use that when we made our video, for instance, for the Hillstead, uh, which is almost a 10 minute video, uh, we did not video ourselves, you know, using Palo Santo and, you know, instruments from cultures that are not our own, again, because of, you know, the very nuanced conversations around cultural appropriation. So uh, we felt like this was a safe space because we were creating a space for ourselves, but certainly... But there's a lot of different, there's sage, there's mugwort we use, we use lots of different herbs. I use incense because you know, that comes from my culture. So there's a, there's a lot of different, you know, um, you know, ways to cleanse things. Um, so anyway, and that could be a very long conversation. That's long, Let's and, it's an, to the... and it's an ongoing conversation. Um, sorry, what was the second question? I got so immersed in that one. <laughs> um, it's it's multi multiple parts, and um, oh, I now remember. I know. Yeah, I know. it's about funding and what's what's. Do you have any any times that you're denied funding or space because of the themes? Or, and what's it sort of when it's up against social justice or injustice, justice, you know, um, yeah. And, and then the last was the conflicts that we come up with working so closely together. Yeah, I think we address the conflicts um, and there are hands in the chat as well. So I don't want to lose in the group hands up. So we don't want to lose those either. Um, but just generally, I think that actually we've been kind of amazed by the response that we've gotten, you know, when we showed at the Armory, a year ago, we had a solo project. We were very fortunate that um, our gallery, which was, you know, it's also been Danielle's gallery for 10 years, just love the project and underwrote it. Um, but it was really kind of like, we just didn't know what to expect because we have independent careers, but we've never made, you know, it was the first time we had made work together. And certainly this was like a major platform. So many people would see it, but we realized that we really, you know, entered a moment where people are so open to these ideas, um, you know, and that people were so responsive. But the other thing is that, you know, for us, we're also connecting it with ideas of social justice. I mean, we are a feminist artist project. Mm -hmm. There's so many voices that have been left out of the conversation. Historically, there are still voices that are being left out of the conversation or not being, um, uh, not being talked about within the context you know, uh, their proper context. And so, um, you know, we're also, we're also providing a space for community as well, you know? Um, and and, and it's I want to say like in short of that, it has been actually hilarious because it has opened actually, we kind of thought, oh, this might be, have, we might have some pushback on this, right? This is like witchcraft and other things. And it, it is, we, we just have, we've gotten so many opportunities. Our head is spinning actually, like, you know, we just, we were joking, like we just, you know, we were offered a, a project in a museum where this curator wouldn't talk to me for 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> so people are very, very, very interested in this subject matter right now. I mean, there's a huge, it's not only us. Um, I mean, we were working alone and then the pandemic happened and then we realized, oh, this is a much wider, subject of course like that's happening and again like it, this is social justice this is about feminism and spiritualism and witchcraft has always been aligned to politics and and to women and to equality so it, it really connects very much in yeah i mean spirituality has also been used as a form of self-empowerment you know throughout cultures <laughs> histories um for women folk and so there is a close allegiance between spirituality and politics and specifically feminist politics. And so it's just, you know, all we're doing is digging into that history and creating new ones uh, through the collective. And we've just found um, so much appreciation for what we do. I mean, I think that it's hard for us to know what we're excluded from because there's so many amazing and talented artists all the, out there who are applying for the same things. And so, um, you know, I mean, as with anything else, it's, um, you know, you win some, you lose some, <laughs> but we just continue uh, making our work. Um, and just in addition to the, you know, the question on challenges, I think that it's really also uh, important to remain flexible. I think when you're working in collaboration, um, I mean, we constantly, 
you know, are surprised by each of our projects. I generally do um, a lot of the writing for Hilma's Ghost, but, you know, in our last project, which is an artist book, you know, uh, we found out, we sat, both sat down to do rituals and we found that Danielle was a whole lot better at writing rituals than <laughs> <laughs> I am. So, you know, she did it's the writing for like this. Hallmark. Yeah, no. Well, it was between the theory and Hallmark. I was like, I don't, you know, like, and there was no in between. No. <laughs> well, she's lucky I edited it. it um, okay. it. <laughs> so we have our different strengths, but we remain flexible in terms of each project is new. And, you know, we try to keep it fresh for ourselves as well. We certainly don't want to uh, repeat ourselves. Um, yeah, we're ready for the next question. I hope that answered the question. Yeah, that was terrific. Um, I have a question down here and the hand that's raised is Maddie's, which, and I think Maddie's already gone unless there's a second question for mm -hmm. Maddie. And I encourage anyone else to please raise your hand and join us. Um, so let's see, we've got one that just came up that said, thank you for acknowledging its history and purpose. It's something that frequently gets overlooked. And as a white person with a public voice, I always hope that it's at the forefront of your thoughts. So I think that had to do with the uh, uh, Palo Santo. Um, and then, um, so that's much appreciated, glad to hear. And then um, there's a question about the tarot deck by Elifus, Elifus Levies oh. um, from the 1800s, what the Golden Dawn, Waite and Smith based their deck on, question mark. I think it was also a deck that was made solely for occult use and restored imagery to pre-Christian symbolism. Have you all dived further back into the tarot roots for your tarot art? I have that tarot deck here. Um, yeah, I mean, that deck um, is a really interesting deck. It's a black and white deck. Um, we have it. Um, you know, I think the interesting thing about, you know, the, the also a beautiful deck. I mean, we use a lot of different decks, including our own, um, I mean, the whole history of um, the Golden Dawn is incredibly fascinating. And <clears throat> again, I think the interesting thing is they, they brought in women in the same, um, in, in the same equal amount as men. Um, and there's also the Crowley, Alistair Crowley's deck, which is also illustrated by Lady Bird, who's a, a woman artist. So there's a lot of different interesting decks. Um, none of them have become as influential as the Rider Waite Smith deck. I mean, none of them. There was something about, um, you know, Pamela Coleman Smith illustrating this that just like kind of electrified hundred, you know, thousands of decks in a way. And, um, and that was the interesting thing about that is this was really a job for her. She's said very little, by the way, about illustrating this deck. All, the only thing we have on record is her saying that it was a lot of work for not a lot of money. And so she had very was, little time to do it. She had very little time. <laughs> And, um, but nevertheless, it, it didn't start out very popular. There was other, there was that deck, there was the Thoth deck, there were a lot of other decks in competition. Um, but the writer Waite Smith has certainly now gone on to influence all the contemporary decks, for sure. Yeah, and actually her there's deck, a lot of great decks out there. Yeah, there's an exhibition, I, it may have come down at the Whitney, but it's called The Age of a New Dawn, I think. Um, and it's really an alternative look at modernism and through other histories. And actually Pamela Coleman Smith is in that exhibition, which shows kind of major recognition in this way. I think her work was also maybe at the Venice Biennial, I'm not sure, but, mm -hmm. um, you know, which has been a kind of big recovery of women artists and magic and mysticism um, in that exhibition as well. But um, there are, her entire tarot deck is actually presented at the Whitney, was, was, was or is presented at the Whitney and one work of hers. She also had a kind of controversial condition and it's controversial because it's not proven by science called synesthesia, which is a cross wiring of the senses. And so she could see music and that's how she created her work. Um, it's very difficult for even museums to really find her work. You know, she died in obscurity, you know, no one knows what hands they had gone into. Uh -huh. And so that was really kind of the, unfortunately the tragic circumstances for even incredibly talented artists like Pamela Coleman Smith, who, you know, um, just didn't get a lot of recognition in their lifetime. Um, we've got a question um, with Arita. Arita, we'll unmute you. Hi, can you hear me okay? 
Yes. Hi. Hi. Okay, great. Hi. Thank you so much um, for this talk. I I was curious about um, your thoughts on um, just the intergenerational aspects of your work and um, especially in relationship to concepts like feminism and spirituality. Um, Yeah, just sort of curious about um, the value you see in kind of bringing folks across generations into this work and um, yeah, also the, you know, the tensions that can emerge in doing collective work cross-generationally. One observation we've had is that the younger generation um, of artists and definitely, you know, of women artists um, are this, this subject matter is through the roof and mm-hmm. in popularity. the reception of it. We're doing six talks this fall, and that is because the young artists in art schools across the country are interested in it and invited us which is kind of, we love that. I think that's so amazing. And I think younger artists really look at this as very, very empowering, you know, in, in a lot of ways. And it, and it is. Um, yeah, no, I mean, I think that, you know, exactly what Danielle said, but it's also, I think that, you know, it's coincided, as we said before, with a moment during the pandemic, which young people went through and young people who are also, questioning old structures because they haven't worked. I mean, they're grossly unequal, we're destroying the environment, you know? Um, And so there's so many social problems, you know, that their generation now has to uh, attend to. And I think that they're also looking for alternative systems, you know? And so we both found with, you know, we both teach in different schools and um, we've really found a re kind of birth in a way of many of these ideas, be it like burning herbs or meditation or, you know, witchcraft, you know, tarot, crystals, um, you know, so there, there, these are entire systems, which were also knowledge systems for many different types of cultures, you know, um, it's just that they have been erased and, but they had a purpose and, that purpose is connected to spirit, which is kind of a dirty word within Western capitalism, you know, and these kind of global structures that we've created. And so it's really a recovery of that. And along with that, the recovery of the divine feminine, you know, um, the qualities that have really, again, been erased by patriarchy. So, and, uh, you know, just on the, uh, the other side of that, we're talking about the younger generation, but we've also really looked upon as probably our professors who are now in their 70s and 80s, who were the major feminists, you know, in the early 70s, really, you know, during this kind of this revolution, that we really draw a lot of their knowledge of going through that experience. But I will say, like, the project does, you're right, it does kind of expand across all those generations, which has something that's been really interesting, you know, for, for us as well. Mm-hmm. I mean, even in our exhibition, Cosmic Geometries, as we said, we had artists from their 20s into their 90s. You know, it really is. There's so much strength that can be gained with these intergenerational bonds that, you know, again, we live in a culture which, you know, sees people as not having a purpose after they're not, you know, like after a certain age. And especially that's especially for women. Ageism affects women much more than it does, you know, men, and along with that, non-binary and trans people as well, right, and queer people. Um, So, you know, really kind of, I think that there's so much strength to be gained. And this is ancient wisdom, right? This is not new wisdom, this is ancient wisdom. And it's just recovering that for a contemporary time. And also within the art world, we certainly gain so much from the people who have come before us. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, really powerful. Thank you. Let's see, Um, we have uh, a question about your daily routine for your work, hours prep and cool down. Um, Read this person, uh, Regina's reading daily rituals, women at at work and and wonder what yours are. What are your daily rituals? Oh, what are my daily rituals? You know, I do pull a card daily. So I I do begin the morning by pulling a card and I do, um, I do some forms of meditation. Um, 
I walk to the studio. That's another form of meditation. But I will say the balance between my own work and homeless ghost work. I mean, we're we're honestly still figuring all of that out because it is growing and growing. And <laughs> that's always a question of how do we divide that up? And so, you know, now we're having a discussion of, oh, okay, we do homeless ghosts two to three days a week and then our own work three to four days a week. Um, but things are more fluid than that because then we have deadlines on projects or things like that. So things kind of ebb and flow. Um, but I would say we are trying to keep both going. You know, we both have long-term practices that we're really interested in, um, that we still want to pursue, or we still do pursue when we're have, both having shows in. <laughs> um, and then there's this kind of other growing Helma's ghost. Um, and we're balancing both. And that's, that's weird. I mean, it's totally weird to be honest. There's I mean, so it's many. Like, it's really unexpected. Yeah, there's so many <laughs> practical too. Yeah, there's so many practical things involved, but we also do, uh, we have an altar, you know, in terms of speaking about rituals. Uh, we do have a Hilma's ghost altar, which is, you know, we're like in the closet it's right now. In the closet. It's hidden in the closet, <laughs> depending on who enters the studio. Uh, right now it's in Danielle's studio because we're looking for a new joint studio um, because we have exhibitions coming up. Um, you know, um, I have an altar at home, which is different from the Hilma's ghost altar, but there are some overlaps. Um, you know, we, we do offerings, you know, we pull cards, we do offerings, we burn herbs, you know, and all of it is really to create a magical space. And this word magic is so abstract, but it really is clearing a space for creativity to happen, right? To elevate those frequencies because our t intention is so strong. And that's what really uh, people who have practiced spirituality in any way understand and know. It's really about harnessing your intention and guiding it. And that itself is so powerful, mm -hmm. an idea that we have, that we have, and we have that power that resides inside of us. We don't need anything else. I mean, these props and other things are tools, you know, to help us get there, but we can really use that inner material. You know, and, and on the idea of ritual or our daily ritual, but even just doing our programs, the idea that like, you know, we open, you know, with a ritual and then we're closing with an invocation where we really go through these deceased women artists and kind of think of the power of how we're connected and our ancestors. That is so uh, complete anti the way we have gone through artist talks for 20 years, <laughs> which is in a very intellectual, straightforward way, which is the way you've probably seen 50 artist talks. Like we, you know, so just even structuring things, is, and we structure the, our drawing space in the same way. I might do candle spells or, you know, we cleanse the space in different ways, or there might be other ways set intentions with sigil making or things like that. And then we close it. And that itself is creating a kind of magical space. Thank you. Um, that, I think that's a great way to end with a creating a magical space. Do you have do you have something else up your sleeves? Oh, <laughs> 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 well, this is wonderful. We're so yeah. Thank happy you so much. We're really grateful you brought us. And, um, thank you. Spaces, but we're sure you're wonderful. And yeah, reach out to us on, a, on Instagram. Yeah, you know, follow us and any questions that you didn't get to answer, or feel free to come to our programs. And again, like we love everything we do is is for free, you know, as an offering to everybody. So thank you so much, Hermista and Danielle. It was wonderful having you. Great. Thank, thank you. you, everyone. Okay, bye.